Hello there, welcome back to the channel. In this video, I'd like to talk about first language acquisition and specifically children's early grammar, children's early syntactic constructions. What I'll have to say is informed by Michael Tomasello's textbook, Constructing a Language. It's a book on first language acquisition from the perspective of usage-based linguistics. What I'll have to say comes from chapter four, pages 94 to 122. And there, Mike Tomasello talks about children's early syntactic constructions and how they emerge in language use. Right, there are three questions that we'll focus on. First of all, what theories about children's early grammar, children's early syntax are there? Uh, then how do children learn language from the input that they hear? You may know that this is actually a very contentious uh, question. Can children learn language from the input that they hear? There's a famous argument made by Chomsky called the argument from the poverty of the stimulus which basically says that no, this is not possible. Uh, in this video, we'll look at evidence that actually points the other way. Yeah, so that it is possible that kids learn from the input that they hear and the language that kids are producing shows similarities with the ambient language, with the language that is produced by the caretakers and the peers of the child. Right. And then uh, a third question is how do children learn basic syntax? So the basic order of elements in a phrase or a sentence, how do children learn to put linguistic units together to form larger units? All right, let's go. So what theories about children's early grammar are there? There are, of course, many theories. And uh, this video won't do justice to the rich landscape of theories that are out there. Uh, Tomasello distinguishes two main types. And the first of this is associated with uh, generative Chomskyan theories of language acquisition. And um, I'm oversimplifying this, of course, but we can think of that spirit of uh, theory as a kind of theory that divides knowledge of language in two main components, namely a uh, dictionary, a um, lexicon that holds entries of words that we know, yeah? and on the other hand, a grammatical component that stores rules, grammatical rules that allow us to put words together to form phrases and sentences, okay? So as a shorthand, we can call this the dictionary and grammar model. <clears throat> and um, well, this is kind of uh, what you would have if next to your desk you have a dictionary with all the words and you can look up what they mean and uh, how they sound and um, what type of word they are and so on and so forth. And then you also have a grammar book that tells you how to put these words together to form larger utterances. And uh, there's information on grammatical relations such as subject and object. There is information on how verb phrases are put together, how relative clauses are formed, how complement clauses are formed, and so on and so forth. Okay. Now, in traditional theories, in traditional generative theories, these two things are kept very cleanly apart. Yeah? And uh, one important difference between these two types of knowledge is also that words have meaning, but rules do not. Rules are really just formal instructions on how to make utterances from smaller component parts. Yeah? Okay, so this is basically the kind of theory that Tomasello is arguing against because he sees uh, fundamental problems with uh, that kind of approach. And um, I'll talk about uh, that. So um, at the heart of the matter, uh, Tomasello presents this as a conflict between two different views, two different hypotheses. So uh, with the dictionary and grammar view, um, would come an assumption that in the literature is called the continuity assumption. The continuity assumption in this case means that children um, acquire adult grammar. Okay, so they learn the kind of grammatical categories 
that you and I as adults are learning. So there's no principal distinction between, let's say, a child grammar and an adult grammar, but rather children set out on the path of acquiring the whole complex grammar that you and I are using. Yeah. Okay. And nobody's confused about the fact that children at first do not talk like adults. So it's clear their utterances are much shorter. There are many things that are missing. So articles, prepositions, um, <clears throat> pronouns, uh, lots of inflections. Yeah. So nobody's confused about that. Um, but uh, it is argued that uh, this is the case because um, not all the rules are in place uh, immediately. Okay, so children acquire a rule and uh, then there are other rules that are not yet in place and that means that the language output is actually, well, imperfect or uh, deviant from an adult perspective. Yeah, so that would be the continuity assumption, the fact that, um, well, the assumption that children learn adult grammatical categories and only realize them imperfectly at first. This kind of view contrasts with what Tomasello calls the item-based learning hypothesis. So just highly oversimplified, uh, what this means is that kids start small. They form small generation uh, the generalizations at first. They learn concrete um, sequences of words, concrete uh, utterances, and they uh, ever so gradually start to generalize over them. Yeah? So children acquire knowledge of lexical items and of fixed strings of lexical items first. So they might learn something like more juice, yeah, without necessarily analyzing more juice into its component parts. So they're not aware that more juice is actually two words. They will learn this as one holistic unit yeah? and use it as such. And only as they acquire more strings of the same type, more milk, more cookie, more singing, they will realize at some point that, oh well, the first part is a unit of its own and the second part is also a unit of its own, so I can combine more with other words that I haven't yet heard in this combination of more and something. Yeah. Okay, so as children acquire more and more of these uh, fixed strings, they begin to see similarities, they begin to form generalizations across these, um, these strings. Yeah? And that's what we talked about in another video as pivot schemas. I'll have more to say about pivot schemas. Um, in the chapter, Michael Thomas Eller uses the term constructions a lot. Constructions are generalizations that children make over um, large numbers of utterances that they hear. Yeah? And so in that sense, they are somewhat similar to the idea of rules. Yeah? So you can think of the pivot schema with more and a noun as a rule that says, okay, you can combine more and something else, and uh, then it gives you this type of utterance. <clears throat> um, Tomasello talks about this as a construction, and that's not only a terminological difference, that is actually also a conceptual difference, and that is something that we need to talk about a little bit. So um, both constructions and rules are generalizations. Yeah? So in a sense, they describe a very similar type of phenomenon. So there are different generalizations that uh, children make that uh, we could talk about here. For instance, uh, children realize that there are verb forms such as walk and walked, say and said, move and moved, scream and screamed. And um, you cannot help but notice that, okay, so there's a first part that describes an activity uh, that is going on right now. And then when I put a d type sound at the end, that means that activity is in the past. Yeah, that is a generalization. That is something that you could state as a rule, 
saying, okay, have verb, put D at the end of it, then uh, you have a past tense form of a verb. But it is also a construction. Yeah? So let me explain. Um, a rule. When we talk about rules, uh, rules would mean that the child learns a recipe for creating a grammatical construction, uh, a grammatical structure. So um, just, um, yeah, like uh, an instruction that tells you, here are two pieces of language, you put them together, you get something new that is grammatical. Yeah? So that rule would allow the child to form new concrete utterances. <clears throat> um, right, um, a construction is subtly different in that uh, it will be assumed that the child learns correspondences like walk and walked, say and said, move and moved, scream and screamed, and that would be their, their main stock of knowledge. Yeah? And uh, at some point they understand that these forms are the same on a more abstract level, so that there are these correspondences between a verb that has just the stem and then a verb that has something extra. Yeah? And uh, these utterances, knowledge of these utterances, allow the child to uh, form a generalization that would then be the construction. Okay, so um, bottom line would be that rules as conceived of in the dictionary and grammar model would be formal, they would be abstract, and they would not be associated with meaning. It would just be an instruction that tells you, okay, two forms, they can be combined, they give you a new form. <clears throat> Whereas constructions uh, are based on concrete examples that carry meaning. Yeah. So all the words that the child knows, uh, they carry meaning, yeah? the, the, the verb in the present tense, the verb in the past tense, and how those relate to each other. And um, the generalizations that would emerge, um, also they are imbued with meaning. Okay, <clears throat> uh, let me say a few more things about early child grammar. Um, even before usage-based linguistics, before Tomasello, there were uh, approaches that were child-centered in the sense that uh, researchers said that, okay, children, they do their own thing, yeah, so they acquire a language in a way that is uh, qualitatively different from adult language, from adult grammar. And um, <clears throat> the idea that children start small and learn a simple grammar at first has been uh, established actually quite early. Uh, there uh, are studies that use the term pivot grammar, yeah? so that's very similar to the pivot schemas that I've been talking about. Um, so that is a tradition that was adopted and uh, extended by Tomasello. There are actually some conceptual differences between uh, brains pivot grammar and uh, Tomasello's usage-based, item-based uh, grammar, but we'll get to those. Yeah? Then, in contrast to that, there are the adult-centered views, uh, which are, as I said, associated with generative Chomskyan approaches to linguistic structure. So there, the view, uh, according to the continuity assumption, would be that children learn, essentially, adult grammar, but realize it with limitations initially. So um, this view is uh, still very much around. Yeah? Um, so Steven Pinker, for instance, has uh, written a famous book called The Language Instinct. It is a couple of years old, yeah? but uh, you can still read it profitably and get a sense of what that perspective on language acquisition is like. Yeah? Okay. Um, so let's look at the child-centered view a little bit and uh, let's talk about pivot schemas. Pivot schemas are, um, so to speak, the first grammatical constructions that children acquire and they have uh, two parts <clears throat> where one part is fixed. So that would be the uh, part 
of a construction that is the same across many different instances, like all x, all done, all wet, all gone. Yeah, so there the child would have a repertoire of forms that start with all and that continue with a different element that can be varied to some extent. So here the child can actually be creative and uh, enter in some new elements. Um, similarly, where's X? Yeah, where's daddy? Where's cookie? Where's doggy? Where's mommy? And so on and so forth. Yeah. Similarly, let's go. Let's find it. Yeah. So that would be the let's X. Uh, pivot schema and in I'm holding it I'm pulling it so that would be a pivot schema that has the ing form as a flexible slot yeah so the the, the verb form that goes in there can vary and uh, the frame is the pivot that is constant now one thing that may be on your mind is well you said two parts but aren't there more then two parts. Well, uh, let's look at where's, for example, here. So you may look at this and think, well, there is uh, the WH form where, and there is the, the, the cliticized form of the copula B. So where is, those are two things. Um, why are you saying it's only one? Well, to the child, it really is just one chunk. Okay, so one holistic unit, the child is not aware that where's actually decomposes into where is. That is an important characteristic of child language that um, we talked about hollow phrases. Yeah, so um, strings of words that the child actually analyzes as holistic units, not uh, individual parts that add up to a complex whole. So where's to all intents and purposes, is just one thing to the child. Yeah. All right. So, child-centered approaches um, to early grammar, early syntactic constructions, they have been onto this idea of pivot schemas for a long time. <clears throat> and uh, the well, the, the 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 idea there would be that uh, this is how syntax, this is how grammar actually emerges in the child's language use, that there are small-scale generalizations yeah, that, that, that start with collections of similar chunks, like all done, all wet, all gone, and so on and so forth. And the child realizes similarities across those and manages to isolate the parts of the pivot schema, the pivot that is fixed and the slot that can be varied. Yeah, so it's it's kind of the germ of um, language as a variable and flexible tool. Okay, um, going over to the other side, yeah, to the adult-centered uh, views of language acquisition. I mentioned that these are associated with generative linguistics, uh, Chomsky linguistics, and I already mentioned the continuity uh, hypothesis as an important idea there. So. Um, the generative linguist quite rightly pointed out that um, getting from pivot schemas to adult grammar, yeah, so uh, that's not a trivial thing. So let's say you've learned things like more juice and all gun uh, and let's dance, yeah. How do you get from there to relative clauses, yeah, so my sister who lives in Birmingham, or how do you get from there to uh, left dislocations or cleft sentences or complement clauses or anything like that. Uh, it seems difficult to say the least. Okay, so, and this has been the line of argument of uh, generative linguistics that, look, <clears throat> yeah, kids may talk like this early on, but there must be something underneath. There must be something that kids latch on to that is far more complex than uh, what you see on the surface, okay? It's not a stupid idea. It's, it's, it's really um, that there is something to it, and it's a challenge, actually, to explain how it is that kids get to this level of complexity eventually, yeah, from where they start. So, um, 
I mentioned it according to the generative worldview. The language of children is mentally represented by the same syntactic rules, same syntactic categories as adult language. So they would operate with uh, the same ideas of subject and object and um, uh, word classes and things that uh, we are using when we are using language. Um, now, the punchline of this kind of argument from the general perspective would be that, look, you cannot really do this just on the basis of the input that you hear. So you need some kind of head start, you need some kind of innate knowledge uh, that is already in place that facilitates the learning process. Okay, So you need a kind of language hardware that is already up and running yeah? so that you can extract everything that's important from the input and uh, yeah, uh, learn adult language in the long run. And uh, the, the slogan that I put here, you can't get there from here, that would express the idea that, look, maybe children start out with a kind of pivot grammar, yeah? an assembly of pivot schemas. But it's definitely not possible to get from a pivot grammar to adult grammar just on the basis of the input. Yeah? <clears throat> so that uh, connects to the idea of the argument of the poverty of the stimulus. The input is too noisy, it is um, too uh, shot through with errors and hesitations and false starts and incomplete sentences for the child to successfully learn the syntactic uh, categories that are necessary that are in use in adult grammar. Okay, and I put a nice picture of Steven Pinker here because the guy has fabulous hair and uh, is a great writer and you should by all means check out uh, The Language Instinct um, just so you know you know, what this theory is about. Right. Some more information on the continuity assumption. On this slide, I put a quote by Andrew Radford. This is a textbook on the acquisition of syntax from the generative perspective, so a kind of evil twin to Mike Tomasello's book. Um, and he has the following to say. He says, once a child is able to parse an utterance, that is, syntactically analyze an utterance, such as close the door, he will be able, yeah, this is the 1990s kids, yeah, everyone was male, basically, um, to infer from the fact that the verb close in English precedes its complement the door, that all verbs in English precede their complements. Okay, so what this means is that um, the assumption is Kids are already born with kind of the information that there are verbs and complements. Yeah? And these two uh, come in a certain order. Either the verb comes first and then the complement, or the other way around. Yeah? Uh, complement, verb. We talked about um, SVO languages, uh, SOV languages, that kind of deal. Yeah? All right. And. Um, what he says here is that if I hear one example, yeah, uh, close the door, and I know that close is a verb, and the door is the kind of structure that is a complement, a yeah, kind of object to a verb, and I hear these two in this sequence, then I immediately click into a generalization that says, okay, the language that I'm learning is VO instead of OV. Yeah, hard to take seriously, but I mean, there it is, uh, Cambridge University Press. Um, okay, I'm snarky, yeah, sorry. Um, didn't mean to be, um, but anyway, that's it. So uh, the bottom line here is that this only works if children are born with the idea that there are verbs, complements, relative clauses, subjects, objects, and so on and so forth. So all of this kind of knowledge has to be in place for this kind of reasoning to work. Yeah. Okay, and um, as I said before, the assumption is that children acquire these rules and they have full competence, full mastery of those rules, but their performance is um, not adult-like because 
first of all, they don't have all the rules in place immediately. And second, uh, they are still limited with regard to uh, so-called performance factors. That is, their working memory may not be as great as yours or mine. My working memory is shitty, by the way. Um, their cognitive processing doesn't work in quite the same way as ours, and so on and so forth. Yeah. All right, so that's it for the continuity assumption. Now let's move on to uh, what Tomasello has to propose in terms of an alternative. Yeah. So uh, at this point, this won't come as a big surprise to you. So uh, he argues that children start out by memorizing and repeating concrete words and phrases. And as a child recognizes similarities across different phrases, there is a process of schematization that sets in. Now, schematization, that's one of the domain general cognitive processes that you and I and children have, and that allows us to abstract away from specifics and uh, form generalizations. Yeah? So one very important skill on a par with joint attention and categorization and analogy making and things like that. Right, so this means that word classes like nouns and verbs and prepositions and whatnot uh, and syntactic constructions like noun phrases and relative clauses and um, <clears throat> uh, subject, yeah? So they emerge as generalizations over concrete utterances, concrete uh, phrases, usage events that we experience. And of course these generalizations are initially very limited, yeah? But they get increasingly abstract until they resemble adult grammar, until they resemble the language use that you and I are uh, capable of. Right. So that, in a nutshell, is Thomas Alva's story, item-based learning from a usage-based perspective. Okay, I'm coming to the second part of this video, where I want to discuss the question how children learn language from the input. The generative worldview was motivated in large part um, by the fact that not much was known about what children actually hear and what they say, quantitatively speaking. Yeah? So um, it's a fairly recent thing that we have extensive corpus data on how children actually use language. All right, um, so what can we learn from this? Um, I want to talk about a study by Cameron Faulkner and colleagues on what children actually hear. So this is a study of child-directed speech. And um, Cameron Faulkner and colleagues used a large corpus of child speech to determine the kinds of syntactic constructions that caretakers and peers use around children. So what is it that uh, you as a baby would have been bombarded with, uh, linguistically speaking? Yeah? And they distinguish different categories of utterances that uh, children would hear regularly. So, and the first category, you see this here, actually confirms the worst uh, suspicion that people had about child-directed speech, namely that there are lots and lots of incomplete utterances. Yeah? So fragments, utterances without subject and predicate, one-word utterances, noun phrases that just hang in there in the air, uh, verb phrases without subjects, prepositional phrases without any context, other multi-word units that are uh, nowhere near complete and nice uh, sentences that you could put on a page. Yeah. So this might seem worrying, right? So how can you learn language from fragments? How can that give you an idea of the big picture of how to form uh, regularly formed uh, syntactic uh, structures? Yeah. Okay, then a second big category are uh, questions. So utterances that have been transcribed in the corpus data with a question mark and that have question syntax in the main clause. So uh, WH questions, what's that? And uh, yes, no questions. Do you want to come? <clears throat> so uh, that's a second one. And then uh, imperatives, 
A third large category, so subjectless requests for child actions. Come over here, you know, clean up your room, things like that. Then there are uh, what Cameron Faulkner and colleagues call copulas, so utterances in which the main verb uh, was some form of to be. Like, that's nice, yeah, it's here, and things like that. Then, down here, so we're already a couple of items down the list, we have what um, resembles, at least, canonical declarative clauses with a subject and a predicate and perhaps an object. Yeah? So subject predicate constructions are utterances that have a subject and a verb, what they call a single lexical predicate. Um, <clears throat> and uh, there are transitive uh, constructions like I want a yogurt. Uh, there are intransitive ones. He's reading. And there are others, like for instance, ditransitives, John gave Mary the book, and a bunch of others. So, so we can think of complement clauses, for instance. I hope that uh, we'll see each other again soon. Yeah. So all of those are subject predicate construction, where you have a subject, a verb, and then some kind of structure that follows the verb. Okay, and then there are complex utterances, utterances with two lexical verbs. So <clears throat> those would be, um, well, let's say uh, clauses that are embedded in one another. Yeah? Complement clause constructions, relative clause constructions, um, clefts, and so on and so forth. So we can call these adult syntax or written syntax or you know, something that is more complex than all the rest. Now, if you want to, uh, you can take a guess. Yeah? You can pause the video and make a little guess. Take these categories, we have six, and uh, write down percentages next to each one of them. So how many utterances do you think are fragments? How many are questions? How many are imperatives, copulas, subject predicate constructions, and complex constructions uh, in the speech that is child directed and the speech that children actually hear okay if you want to do that pause the video now because i am going to reveal what's going on right here so uh here we have, have a pie chart pie charts are evil yeah but uh that's what they had in the paper and um yeah let's look at this so <laughs> fragments and questions make up yeah about half of the data, yeah, <laughs> um, more than half actually. So, <clears throat> yeah, uh, so twenty percent of what the child hears is not even grammatically correct. Yeah, it's, it's just a piece of a complete grammatical syntactic structure. Uh, lots of questions, yeah. <clears throat> Lots of uh, copula constructions, like that's nice, it's here. Um, some imperatives, yeah. clean your room. Stand up straight with your shoulders <laughs> like so. <clears throat> um, and uh, here we have the subject predicate constructions and the complex constructions, and you see that taken together, well, 24%. That is sort of the amount of decent grammar that you get as a child. The remaining 75% is relatively simple or even fragmented. Right, um, here's a breakdown of the pie chart that is uh, a bit more detailed. Yeah? So in the questions, we have the WH questions and the yes, no questions. In the uh, subject predicate uh, category, we have the transitive constructions, the intransitive, and the other. And you notice here that, well, transitive account, that th those account for uh, a relatively high percentage of examples in that category. Yeah. So in these columns, you see the numbers of tokens from um, Cameron Faulkner's and colleagues' study. And they link this, they compare this to an earlier study that has been done 
in 1981, finding that uh, the numbers, even though in the earlier studies the numbers of tokens were much, much lower, they actually line up pretty well, yeah, if you're looking at this. So it seems that what we're finding here, yeah, and in the pie chart, is uh, not so much out of the ordinary, but seems to be rather generalizable. Okay, so that just as a first impression of what children hear. But we want to go a little bit more into the details of uh, how these constructions actually look like in practice. So here is an overview of some of the fragments that um, were recorded in the corpus data. So we have noun phrase fragments like the indefinite determiner a uh, plus noun. That occurs uh, a lot of times. Yeah, uh, The definite determiner with a noun. Some kind of numeral, like two cookies. Yeah, Possessives, my cookie. Yeah, And then um, these four account for a relatively large proportion of all fragments, of all nominal fragments, and you see that there is a long tail of fragments that appear more rarely. Yeah? So, and this is actually a pattern that we see uh, throughout language. Yeah? So that usually there is some kind of distribution where there's one or two structures that appear much more often than all the remaining structures of the same type. <clears throat> um, in earlier sessions, I've talked about ZIF's law and uh, the idea that certain elements in language appear much more often than others. Yeah? Uh, and we have something similar going on in syntactic constructions, so that there is usually one type that is much more frequent than all the others. Right. Um, let's look at the prepositional phrases. Here we have one preposition that appears much more often than uh, others, at least. Here, yeah? So we have in and then a noun phrase, we have on and then a noun phrase, we have with and then a noun phrase, and these three, in, on, with, they account for the lion's share of all prepositional phrase fragments that we find in the data. Right, okay, so that's the basic lesson uh, of, of the fragments and of other constructions as well, that um, usually there is one instantiation of a construction, of a schema, that is more frequent, that serve as a kind of prototype for the child to memorize and latch onto. Moving on to questions, we actually see a similar picture. So on this slide, you see different boxes for questions with different WH words. So we have a box for what question, so what's, that is a very frequent pattern what are, what do, what did, and so on and so forth. We have a box for who, for why, for how, for which, and for where. And uh, in these tree diagrams here, you see frequent patterns with uh, what and with who. Okay, so what questions tend to have this shape? They tend to be followed with uh, the, the S, yeah, a form of to be, is or criticized S. Uh, what's, and then there are two frequent patterns, uh, what's that and what's this. And then there's this slightly more complex pattern, that's actually the most frequent one, what's noun doing, yeah? what's mommy doing, that would be this kind of question. And you see that that is actually, that accounts for a large proportion of WH questions. So the prototype of WH questions that a child would hear are questions along these lines. What's daddy doing? Yeah. Uh, what's daddy going to do? So <clears throat> this points into the same direction of uh, what I've been talking about earlier, that there is a prototype that children can actually remember along the lines of uh, how children would um, acquire pivot schema so that there are parts in the utterance that are the same, that are fixed, and those can be learned, those uh, patterns can be learned as uh, a whole. And little by little, the children can figure out that parts in that schema can actually be replaced 
by uh, other elements that they can choose more or less freely. Okay, WH questions. There's more. Uh, here's a similar view of yes, no questions, uh, starting with uh, different verb forms. Are you, can you, do you, have you, is it, shall we, and so on and so forth. And you notice um, that uh, four of these actually start with uh, you as the second element. Yeah, so all of them have you as the most frequent realization. Are you, can you, do you, have you. On this side here, you can see um, the most frequent continuations of questions with are you. Yeah, are you tired? Are you verbing it? Are you going to some kind of verb phrase, are you going to go and, are you going to put this there? So again, the child can latch on to a um, fixed part of a question, are you going to, and uh, then realize that there are different possible continuations. So this is starting small with uh, yes, no questions, starting with a fixed pattern and gradually branching out from that pattern. Right, uh, here we have the imperative and the copula uh, construction. So in the imperatives, again, we have the picture of some verbs that are highly overrepresented. Come, look, let's. So yeah, what does the child hear? Come here, look at that, let's do this. Put it there, don't, yeah? So that is what you see here in gray. And then of course, some variation, a long tail of imperatives that occur less often. But the child has a chance to focus on these most frequent elements and establish that as a prototype of the imperative construction in their language use. Here we have the copula constructions, and no surprise, that's, it's, theirs, and so on and so forth. Those are the most frequent realizations of uh, copula constructions that kids hear. Yeah, uh, here are the continuations of that's or that is. Uh, and again, unsurprisingly, most of them are followed by a definite noun phrase. Oh, that's a cat. How interesting. Yeah, that's the cat. That's it. That's not. That's it. It's his. And that's Timmy. Yeah, the name. Right. <clears throat> Uh, one question that, uh, of course, follows from this is, uh, do children actually talk like their mothers? Do they replicate what's in the input? Or do they uh, just talk uh, by stringing words together in ways that nobody has ever heard before? Yeah, that's a common argument that you hear. Uh, maybe you've even heard me say that, yeah, so kids say things that no one has ever said before. Uh, adults, they produce sentences that no one has ever uh, heard before. If you take one of these books behind me, you open that at, at any point, put your finger down, you will read a sentence that you haven't read before in this form. So language is incredibly creative, but is there some kind of signature? Is there some telltale sign that children actually resemble their mothers or their caretakers in the way they do. So this is something that uh, Cameron Faulkner and colleagues were able to answer. So they have 12 children in their corpus and they measured the frequencies of constructions in the speech of the mother and they then correlated those frequencies with the frequency of the same construction in the speech of the child. Okay, so naturally the mothers, they, uh, they, they talk more, yeah? so they have more utterances, there's more data, uh, but you can still calculate correlation. So what is the most frequent construction a child uses? And uh, how often do children use, let's say, uh, noun phrase constructions with indefinite determiners, the cat, uh, noun phrase constructions with definite determiners, the cat, one apple, my juice and so on and so forth yeah so indefinite definite numerical possessive and uh, the numbers that you have in this table describe correlation statistics so <clears throat> 
correlation statistics works in such a way that uh, we have, uh, let's say, a graph like this, where there are frequency values for the speech of the mother. Let's say this up here is the most frequent construction that the mother is using. Yeah? And uh, this down here is the least frequent construction that the mother is using. And we line up those frequency values on the x-axis with frequency values of the same constructions in the language of the child. So you see that the construction, I mean, this is of course made up data, but uh, the most frequent construction that the mother is using is also the most frequent construction in the language of the child. Right, so from these uh, from this illustration of what a correlation statistic is about, let's look at the numbers in the table. And what we see is that the frequency with which mothers use indefinite determiners in noun phrase constructions, that correlates positively, yeah? not perfectly, but positively, with how often children use these kinds of constructions. And uh, same with... Uh, Definite determiners, yeah, so the frequency of definite determiner noun phrase constructions in the mother's language correlates positively and significantly with uh, how these uh, constructions are used in the child's language. <clears throat> um, what do these other numbers mean? So, for example, um, how often mothers use noun phrases with numerical uh, determiners, so, so one apple, two cookies, and so on and so forth, that doesn't allow you to predict how often children will use noun phrases with indefinite determiners. Yeah? So how often the mother says two cookies doesn't predict how often the child will say a cookie. Yeah? So it's not that these um, different realizations of what we would just call noun phrases syntactically, the different types uh, don't generalize to one overarching schema, but rather uh, indefinite correlates with indefinite, definite correlates with definite, numerical correlates with numerical. Yeah? So the number of times the mother says something like two cookies correlates with the number of types, number of times the child says something like um, one cat. Yeah. Okay. And that's not only the case for noun phrases, that's also the case for uh, copula constructions like there's the cat or that's daddy or it's a shame. Yeah. So again, we have uh, there's NP and there's NP and that correlates positively and significantly. We have that's NP and that's NP and that correlates positively and significantly. And for it's NP, it is the same. And uh, how often the mother says, there's the cat, doesn't correlate, yeah, doesn't give you a significant prediction for how often the child will say, it's a cat. Yeah? So theirs doesn't predict its or vice versa. Okay, so that's interesting because that shows that um, children do indeed talk like their mothers. They emulate the frequency profile of the constructions that they hear in the ambient language. Now, uh, I'm moving on to the third part of this video. How do children learn basic syntax? So far, we've looked at empirical data about um, utterances, at utterances that uh, mothers and children actually produce. Now let's look at uh, data that has been gathered in slightly different ways. So uh, the experiment that I want to talk about uh, has been carried out by Akhtar in uh, 1999. And uh, here we are using uh, an experiment with nonce words, with words that have been made up for the purpose of the experiment. Yeah? So we've talked about tamming and things like that. And we're actually going back to tamming. Yeah? Uh, so here, in this experiment, children were taught to use new verbs like dacking, gopping, and tamming. And um, <clears throat> the, uh, um, well, the, the, the experiment tied these uh, three verbs, dacking, gopping, tamming, to different word orders. So dacking um, occurred in a word order that resembles our 
subject verb object order. So the robot dacking the banana, that would be a pattern where the verb is in the middle, the subject is in front, and the object comes last. Gopping worked in a different way so that it occurred last. So here we have subject, object, verb, kind of like Japanese or Turkish. Yeah? The robot, the banana, gopping. And the children had to learn that gopping works in this way. And then we have verb initial, uh, tamming the robot, the banana. So that would be V-S-O. That's also a word order that's attested in the world's languages, but of course not in English. And the question is, can we teach children to use these different word orders? <clears throat> so how did that happen? Uh, here you see a picture of dacking. Bam. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> um, and the researcher would uh, do this yeah, in a lab setting, and they would tell the child, <laughs> the robot dacking the banana. Let's look at it again. Okay, the robot dacking the banana. That's dacking. Here's gopping. So watch closely. <laughs> the robot, the banana, gopping. Once more. The robot, the banana, gopping. With a subject, verb, no, 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 subject, object, verb. Tamming. By now you, you sort of anticipate what's coming. Tamming the robot, the banana. Tamming the robot, the banana. Okay, so what, uh, what happened in the experiment? There were 36 children, three groups, different ages. So 12 children that were between two and three years old. Uh, 12 children that were three years old, between three years and two months, three years and 11 months. So, and uh, 12 children that were four years old. So we can talk about two-year-olds, three-year-olds, four-year-olds. And all children heard the three novel verbs with their corresponding word order. So each verb was just tied to one word order. Yeah? No variation, no nothing. Um, there was also a control verb. So a verb that uh, the children already knew. Dacking, gopping, and tamming. They didn't know before the experiment. But something like pushing, well, that is very likely that they knew what that word was what that means yeah so as a two-year-old usually you know what pushing is you know how to push things around um okay so in the training phase what the experimenters did was uh, presenting the activity talking along and introducing the children to tamming and doc um what is it backing and gopping and uh the the, the crucial phase after the training phase was the test phase where the experimenter asked okay now it's your turn what is happening and they would show scenes of dacking gopping or tamming and uh, the child would have to describe that and the crucial question now is how did the children describe these events yeah and did they use the correct word order correct in the sense of did they say the robot dacking the banana? Did they say the robot the banana gopping? Or did they somehow mix it up and say, okay, the robot gopping the banana, the robot tamming the banana? Yeah, that would be easier because it conforms to the SVO order that we all know and love. Yeah, so usually when we use a verb, we put it in the middle, subject, verb, object, and that's the end of it. Yeah, um, but here, well, the children heard them in a different way. So the robot, the banana gopping, the verb is at the end. Do they replicate this? Yeah. And if you want to, you can pause the video here and uh, write down some uh, thoughts, some uh, yeah, hypotheses about what will happen. I will continue now. So here are the results. Um, what you see are, uh, well, before I talk about the graph, all uses of the novel verbs were transcribed, so the, the, the children uh, were recorded, their responses were recorded, and uh, the responses were classified into matching. Yeah, so the children repeated exactly what they had learned in the training phase, and non-matching, so there something was uh, changed in the word order. Right, and now let's look at the graph. 
we have uh, three lines for decking, gopping, and tamming. We have an x-axis with the two-year-olds, the three-year-olds, the four-year-olds. So this can be read as like a progression in age. And we have uh, a mean proportion of matches. So a one, that would mean that all children did this correctly. Yeah, They gave the exact response that <coughs> uh, corresponded to how they had been trained. Now, let's look at the top line here, Elmo decking the car. So, um, you know what? Hit pause and explain to yourself what this top line means. Yeah? Do it now. I'm going to continue. Um, so, this top line, of course, means that the two-year-olds were at 100% accuracy. Now it's your turn. What's Elmo doing? And they said, Elmo decking the car. Huh? Three-year-olds, same thing. Four-year-olds, same thing. So SVO is uh, replicated just like that. The interesting thing, of course, is what happens with SOV and uh, VSO. And there you see that, well, the kids aren't as accurate. Huh? So we have the two-year-olds, the three-year-olds, and the four-year-olds. And um, yeah, so another situation where I want you to pause the video and explain to yourself what's going on with these lines. They go down. Yeah. So here these are the two-year-olds, the three-year-olds, the, the four-year-olds. Um, let's first just talk about the fact that the lines go down. What does that mean? Yeah, I'm going to continue now. The fact that these go down means that the four-year-olds are actually performing the worst. Now, isn't that funny? Yeah, so the four-year-olds, who should be the smartest in this experiment, they are actually producing the least, the fewest uh, accurate responses. So they're doing something else. And the question is, what are they doing? You can probably guess what they're doing, and you would be right. Uh, in that these children, the four-year-olds, are correcting the word order to SVO. Yeah? So they will say things like Elmo tamming the car or Elmo gopping the car. Why do they do that? Well, they do that because they have learned that English verbs like to occur after the subject, before the object. Yeah? SVO, that is what the four-year-olds have uh, <clears throat> learned from the input. And now we have some weird exception, and they're not having it. They're like, no, 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 no. I'm doing this the old-fashioned way. Yeah, S V O, like my mother told me to. Yeah. Okay. Now looking at the two-year-olds and three-year-olds, you see that this is actually a progression. So the two-year-olds are the most conservative verb users. They're like, yeah, well, gopping. It goes at the end. That's where it is and they say Elmo the car gopping, or they say Tamming Elmo the car. Mind you, not all of them, yeah? But a significant percentage of two-year-olds and three-year-olds replicate the weird word order from the experiment. <clears throat> and so that means that, um, well, we can talk about why the others didn't do it, yeah? Did they not have the capacity to memorize correctly how these verbs had to be ordered? Um, do they already have some kind of generalization as to how verbs fit into a sentence? That is, uh, those are all possibilities. But what's interesting is indeed that the um, two-year-olds and three-year-olds are more conservative. They take more seriously the possibility that verbs might actually behave differently. So there's something that uh, there's an idea that Tomasello calls the verb island hypothesis. And that would be the hypothesis that children assume that verbs have uh, one specific way of occurring with other elements in the utterance. <clears throat> so uh, many verbs in English can occur both transitively and intransitively. So I can say, I've eaten an apple. I can say, I've already eaten. Yeah? Kids don't like that. Yeah? So when kids learn verbs early on, they tend to focus on just one schema. So they use a verb either transitively or intransitively. But before they generalize across that, well, 
that takes some time. Yeah, and something similar is going on here. The kids are conservative with regard to how they assume verbs can be used. Right, so just to sum this up, uh, all children correctly reproduce the SVO word order. Younger children uh, reproduce a large ratio of SOV and VSO, and the older children, they correct to SVO. They have learned the generalization. And um, when <clears throat> uh, we look at the control um, construction, yeah, we have younger children who uh, reproduce not Elmo the car pushing, but Elmo pushing the car. Okay, so remember that in uh, the control uh, condition here, the robot, the banana pushing, the actual experiment was with, was with Elmo and the car. Yeah, uh, they correct this to SVO. So that's interesting because in adult-centered approaches, word order is supposed to be a general rule. So as soon as you figured out that you hear close the door, okay, close is the verb, the door is the complement. It should be that we have subject, verb, object in all cases. That's the story. Yeah? As soon as the child hears one example of SVO, they should conclude that the language is SVO and only use SVO. The results that we get from this experiment, they indicate that learning basic word order is actually more of a gradual thing, so that young children assume that different verbs function differently, and older children have a greater tendency to correct to SVO because they know that English verbs are typically used in this way. All right, for the last part of this video, I want to talk about a different study uh, that looks at determiners. So this is a corpus-based study by Pine and Levin, uh, and they've been investigating how children use determiners. Now, when you and I hear a new word, a new noun, and uh, let's say we hear it used with an indefinite determiner, we automatically know that this noun can also be used with a definite determiner. So, uh, let's say we haven't heard the word rabbit before. We have, of course, but that's fine. Uh, so when you hear someone say a rabbit, you immediately know that you can also say the rabbit. Question is, do children know that too? Yeah, That is what's being investigated in this study. So it's a corpus study of determiner usage in 12 different children. The corpus follows the children through time, starting at one year of age and ending at three years of age. And audio recordings were made at six-week intervals. So researchers would come into the house, get out the tape recorder, play with the children, and uh, make recordings. Right. And you can imagine determiners are actually very frequent. So these are forms that we hear a lot and also in the children's speech. Uh, so here are the 12 children, Anna, Alan, Charles, and so on. And you see that all of them use indefinite and definite articles. So the X's don't mean it's not there. The X's mean this is attested. And in this column, we can see the total number of nouns that the children use with definite or indefinite articles. So Anna uses 18 different nouns with definite or indefinite articles. Cat, cookie, juice, what have you, yeah? Um, there's even a column on uh, semantics, so some non-concrete nouns. Uh, let me think what non-concrete nouns a child might use. Well, night, maybe, or morning, something like that. Anyway, um, now in this table here, <clears throat> uh, Pine and Levin show the overlap of indefinite and definite determiners for all the nouns. Yeah? So um, <clears throat> do children use the same verb, uh, the same noun with the indefinite determiner and the definite determiner? And um, here you see something something striking, actually. Yeah? That is that um, most of the children show very, very little overlap. Yeah? So Anna uses 18 nouns, but none of them are used with both types of determiner. Alan, the same thing, 23 nouns, but uh, none of them share usage of both the, uh, the indefinite and the definite. Yeah? 
<clears throat> right. Um, so overlap is, is quantified, and they do some statistical testing on this. And because there are not so many, uh, none of this is really significant. But as a phenomenon, as a tendency, this is still very interesting. Yeah. Okay. So what do the results show us? The results uh, show that different types of determiners are used across different syntactic contexts. So when children produce constructions um, that are a bit more complex, that have a subject, a verb, and an object, <clears throat> um, the subject noun phrases will hardly ever have any determiners. So let's Perfectly to be expected. Subjects, we expect them to be known information. They're expressed with pronouns. Uh, it's usually I or you or names like daddy. Yeah. So, uh, so far so trivial, but it's still noteworthy. And um, we have several children even that don't have definite determiners in prepositional phrases. So when we have um, something like in the house, yeah, so a child might say something like in the house, but they would not say in a house. Yeah. Okay, so in this table we see a kind of breakdown. Uh, there's only one child that uses articles in a subject position, like the rabbit ate the carrot. Yeah. Most of the other children don't do that. Yeah. No indefinite determiners at all, and just one definite determiner. Um, by contrast, in noun phrases that follow the verb, there, most of the children, so Alan is the exception here, uh, use nouns with determiners. And in um, <clears throat> uh, noun phrases that are inside a preposition, we have this distribution. Most children use the definite determiner, but we have four children that don't use the indefinite determiner inside a noun phrase that sits in a prepositional phrase. <clears throat> um, right. Um, another result that is worth pointing out is that different children have different schemas, different patterns uh, that involve determiners. So Anna likes patterns such as in a something, in a box. Yeah? Alan likes on the something, or in the something. Charles says in the something or want a something. And um, <clears throat> Helen has things like that's a something or like a something. So it's not that all of these children learn determiners in the same way. Rather, they each uh, hold on to certain schemas, pivot schemas that they have acquired. And that is how they build up their knowledge of uh, definite determiners and indefinite determiners. So, in conclusion, when children start to use determiners, they use them in pivot schemas, like there's the x, or that's a something, or on the something. something. Sorry. Um, this means that um, the data don't really suggest that children generalize across pivot schemas with the and a. Uh, so, there's the dog does not mean that the child learns how to say there's a dog. Uh, children treat definite and definite determiners as different, as not what linguists would call paradigmatically related. Yeah? So if two items are paradigmatically related, they encode some kind of contrast like present and past or first person, second person, things like that. Yeah? Definite and indefinite determiners do something of that kind. And we as adult speakers know that, but children learn determiners more in a more conservative fashion. Okay, that's it for this video. Uh, if you are my student, please read uh, Tomasello, pages 123 to 144, and complete online quiz uh, number six. And I hope to see you next week with a new video and new discussion. All right, that's it. Bye.